uh, so last week uh, we discussed um, uh, basic structure. I mean, we, we fixed the notations and a brief discussion on the effective Lagrangian starting uh, from some free uh, field theories. We have writ written down the Lagrangians <coughs> for a scalar fermion gauge field. And those are building blocks for the standard model. So today, uh, but uh, at that time, we don't know how to introduce uh, gauge forces <coughs> like uh, electromagnetic force and other forces uh, at the level of Lagrangian. Uh, we want to describe the uh, interactions between the fundamental particles in the standard model. So today we are going to discuss the structure, the, the detailed structure of the standard model, not just pa uh, particle content. For that, um, I think that today uh, we are going to discuss the gauge theories from starting from uh, non-relativistic uh, uh, theory for electromagnetisms and also relativistic theory and generalization to non-abelian gauge theories. And then, uh, of course, we are constructing the Lagrangians and, and also we'll discuss the uh, of course, the uh, standard model gauge theory, SU3 cross SU2 cross U1. So you need to know a little bit on the group theory in order to uh, understand uh, the structure of the standard model. So, so we, we, I think the, for this lecture, the basic uh, knowledge of group theory will be helpful. Uh, although there are uh, serious uh, textbooks uh, on group theory, you can, if you have any questions, if you have any thing to know, then you can look up uh, to the textbooks uh, the, on group theories. So today, and then an Higgs mechanism, spontaneous symmetry breaking, and Higgs mechanism. So I will, the Higgs mechanism, uh, kind of spontaneous, the idea of the spontaneous symmetry breaking, uh, kind of adopted uh, from condensed matter physics like a superconductivity, uh, BCS uh, superconductivity. And I mean, <clears throat> actually it's kind of a microscopic theory of superconductivity <clears throat> was uh, discovered by uh, Barden Cooper Schrieffer, BCS, uh, stand for the initials. The spontaneous symmetry breaking so SSB is a spontaneous spontaneous symmetry breaking um, with a chabalchogin punge. It's a spontaneous uh, in Korean chabalchogin punge. Chabalchogin teaching some punge. So spontaneous symmetry breaking. So uh, uh, after the gauge theories, <clears throat> uh, the gauge theory, gauge symmetries are broken symmetries in nature. So we are going to discuss uh, what is the spontaneous symmetry breaking and what is the difference? Because of course the spontaneous symmetry breaking is everywhere, um, but uh, it is not enough to uh, give masses to uh, gauge forces, so you need a Higgs mechanism for that. So there's the kind of distinction between global and local symmetries. So actually, the 
the particle, the idea of spontaneous symmetry breaking particle physics uh, is from the breaking of global symmetry. So global, maybe we have to distinguish between global and local symmetry or gauge symmetries. Uh, the difference, uh, there's a crucial difference, difference between global and local symmetries. And uh, the breaking of global or local symmetries are distinct in the sense that uh, there will be some Goldstone bosons, so we call number uh, Goldstone boson on one hand. Due to the spontaneous symmetry breaking of the global symmetry. But uh, in the case of local symmetry, you have a gauge field, and then uh, those uh, gauge bosons receive masses. So instead of mass, so this number of goldstone bosons are massless. Uh, on the other end, on uh, for local symmetry, when it is broken spontaneously, then you have massive gauge versions. So of course, the, you need to count the number of degrees of freedom. The number of degrees of freedom is uh, matched in both cases. So in the, if you heard, already uh, the longitudinal component of the gauge boson, longitudinal will be the would be, we, we call, we use this word would be, uh, would be, Number Goldstone bosons. Over here, this is So just you can say Goldstone bosons. Uh, okay, so here, uh, so degree of freedom uh, would be, sorry, so would be, would be, would be. So we are going to uh, discuss, uh, this is the very uh, important part of our discussion in this lecture. Um, I think that, oh, this lecture, this lecture schedule, okay, here. So after that, uh, we are going to discuss uh, uh, also the details on the weak interactions, like a neutral current. And after that, not today, but maybe tomorrow, uh, next week, maybe in the neutral current and charged current. Those are very important uh, for electro weak. Uh, uh, so these are uh, weak interactions. Describing weak interaction. Neutral current and charge current and also flavors. So this is the CKM mixing. The very young masses. So those uh, will be next week. So there will be a lot of materials to be covered uh, in the next, uh, this week and next week, because we have a lot to discuss and for the standard model and dark matter. So 
I, actually, I forgot to tell you about dark matter in the last week because uh, it is about the standard model and dark matter, but I forgot to tell you about dark matter. So maybe a little bit about uh, before going into the details of the standard model, let me tell you about a uh, brief introduction on dark matter. But I'm going to tell you the standard thing like a galaxy rotational curve, etc. But just uh, I'm going to tell you the, what is the kind of um, uh, and the properties of the dark matter. And maybe then uh, we know that uh, what is the content of the standard model in the last lecture. So just let me briefly tell you about dark matter and then <clears throat> go to uh, the structure of the standard model. So in cosmology, uh, I, I think the we call lambda CDM model. The dark matter has a lot of there are a lot of evidences, and uh, in particular densities, the energy density. Dark matter about five times the baryon uh, uh, energy density. So those this is baryon. Uh, if that experiment result, yeah, those are actually uh, locally uh, the dark matter component in the local universe might be uh, depending on where you are, but uh, uh, on average, so this are. Uh, On average, and of course, if you go to galaxy clusters, then this is the typical value that you see, uh, yeah, for dark matter density. So galaxy clusters. If you go to larger and larger scales, and on average, uh, there's a precise number for dark matter density in cosmological scales. So cosmological scales uh, uh, we'll discuss maybe soon. Uh, what is the meaning of the cosmological scales? But these are uh, uh, cosmological scale and galaxy scales and galaxy clusters. So on on that uh, scales, the dark matter number density is five times larger than the baryon density. Baryon includes baryon is composed of quarks, baryon proton and neutron, and the lepton masses. You can even know them. So just to, it's a matter, so normal matter, and not dark matter, normal matter. So and we know that the dark matter density is something like this. And the density, of course, there are a lot of. Uh, evidence is for for this okay so of course galaxy galaxy rotation curves you know uh, the galaxy is a uh, scale about up to 100 kiloparsec and also galaxy uh, clusters. So normally, in the case of galaxy clusters, so galaxy rotation curves like something like this, right? So here there's the center, and then star. Here, uh, orbiting around uh, the center of the galaxy, then you have you can measure this speed, right? As a function of the distance uh, from the center of the galaxy. Galactic center. So then typically uh, it 
increases and decrease. So this is the typical uh, uh, without dark matter. So without dark matter, we expect this kind of uh, behavior uh, for the galaxy rotational curves. But the, the reality is that uh, this curve is saturated. So these are uh, with the dark matter and the observed value of the velocity, velocity curve saturated. Uh, and then this increase uh, here uh, because the metal density keep increasing. So total metal uh, inside the stock uh, sphere of radius R, the total metal, the total mass increases because of the disk. So this roughly uh, the maximum uh, when the velocity becomes maximal, uh, you have reached the disk radius. So this you have this here, disk, something like this, and kind of concentrated something like this. So the visible matter is localized on the disk. It's not a spherical shape, and the most of matter component will be localized in this uh, region, disk inside the disk, and then there's nothing outside. So you can treat the total mass of galaxy as a point particle, and just you follow four of the velocity curve is four of by one over square root, square root of the distance. But uh, this is not the case, so because of that, we, we, are, we need something more invisible, so which is uh, dark matter. So galaxy cluster six k is more than the distance, more than one megaparsec. But in the case of galaxy clusters, uh, there is the, there is no rotations. It's only uh, these versions. Uh, because the random, the, I mean, the, there's the individual galaxies and galaxy clusters uh, moving around randomly. So average velocity is zero, but the dispersion, velocity square is non-zero. Because of uh, the video theorem, uh, this is the uh, the the kinetic energy, the average kinetic energy is proportional to the average of the gravitational energy. So then you can infer the total mass M if you know the size. So this is the size of galaxy cluster. And uh, if you measure velocity dispersion, then you can infer the total mass. So that is the gravitational mass. And then the visible mass you can uh, infer uh, from uh, optical or X-ray uh, telescope. But these uh, do not match up the gravitational mass inferred from the rotations, I'm sorry, dispersion of the individual uh, galaxies. So because of that, uh, you, you can see, say that uh, there is a uh, strong evidence for dark matter and galaxies and galaxy clusters. And also cosmologically, it is necessary, dark matter is a necessary component. We call it cosmological scales. Cosmology is much larger than one megaparsec. So it's a, we call cosmological scale, I forgot though, about more than 1,000 uh, megaparsec uh, scale is the uh, cosmology. And then this kind of, this cosmological scale is the uh, horizon, about horizon scale. In, uni in the expanding universe, we have, I mean, even if the universe is not expanding, we have a horizon. And if you go back in time through the past 
So here we are. Here, also here, and then this is the horizon, right? There is a horizon distances. So this is horizon. The signal can reach us uh, with the speed of light or less than the speed of light. So that because of that, we are limited view uh, to the past. Well, everything coming to us will be the kind of uh, foot, footprint of the past. So that is the limited size uh, of, of the universe that we have access to. So cosmological scale is the, such a large scale. Uh, but the, yeah, the universe is much larger than that. Just we don't have an access to the past. If you go in time, uh, maybe in the future, maybe you have more access to the past. But currently, because of just to, uh, the age of universe is finite, we have a limited uh, uh, distance that we have access to. So, in any case, cosmology descri described by lambda CDM. So, lambda is dark energy. And cold dark matter. This is the cold and this is the dark matter. So, major component of the, our universe can be uh, uh, can, can be uh, parameterized in this form. And this I equal to the baryon and dark matter, and lambda is dark energy. So this is the dark energy. So at uh, this omega and then omega low C uh, is the three times Planck mass square. I, I think that we are going to discuss this in more detail, but uh, just to uh, so called critical density. Critical density, you can say that the critical density is the total energy, total energy density. So you can combine everything in the universe. You can define the critical density at, at the given time. So actually this uh, critical total energy density also depend on time because this H is a Hubble parameter. Because Hubble parameter depends on time. H equal to H function of time and this function of time why because the universe is expanding and um, and then also the expansion rate uh, depends on time so this is a is function of time and this is the scale factor core scale factor so the bottom line is uh, rho c is time dependent. But uh, so we, we are going to measure the necessary energy component in the past, like a CMB, cosmic microwave background. Micro. Uh, background. So microwave background is far past in, in the universe. It's like a 380,000 uh, years after Big Bang, right? So it's locally a jet uh, it's about 1,000, and jet means it's the redshift factor, which is defined that uh, uh, by the scale factor. So scale factor is a function of time, but you can 
the scale factor is something like this can be written down in this way so when so g uh, so so this a0 is the present the size the radius of the universe at present so, so because of that jet equal to zero equal to our current time at present present so jet is greater than one is the past so this uh, jet equal to 100 is when the radius of the universe is uh, one in thousand or one in thousand is very small so we are, our universe is very small so at the time we have a cosmic the period of cosmic microwave background and uh, we can uh, actually photons the kind of uh, homogeneous photons coming from the all directions in the sky now those uh, emitted uh, at the time of cmb uh, called the CMB recombination. So I think that there are a lot dis to discuss about that, but so just I want to point out that uh, we are inferring to uh, the ratio of the energy densities at this period far in the past, not at present. Of course, we are measuring those photons, but uh, we need the information uh, from CMB recombination to present. So those information, uh, we need uh, energy component. So for, from there, uh, we can infer. So because of this critical energy density that has kind of reference energy density changes in time. So when I say the omega B is now current, current, current units. So we are defining critical energy density is three times to M Planck scale H0. So H0 is a uh, Hubble constant here. Hubble constant to, uh, is about uh, uh, seven uh, per mega second so this uh Hubble constant just to let me uh uh Hubble law Hubble law this is the uh so this is Hubble law right that's the velocity is the receding or this velocity uh galaxy uh, so galaxies are uh, moving away from us uh, with certain velocity proportional to the luminosity distance from us and this linear relation uh, there's a proportional uh, constant first proportionality constant h0 is Hubble constant this is Hubble law so so h0 is measured uh, value at present, or you can measure the Hubble constant in the past, and you can use the kind of Friedman equation to obtain H0 at present. So CMB kind of measure the expansion rate uh, in the past, and then you can just to let it uh, evolve in time to determine H0. So there's also interesting story about H0 measurement. Uh, there are several ways to determine H0. So yeah, so this too much. Omega, so in any case from CMB, omega uh, baryon is 0.5%. Uh, so omega dark matter equal to 0 0.27. Mega lambda equal to 0 0.68. So yeah, this is the because of the dark matter in, in the reference, it's like a, this omega dark matter called omega C, the cold dark matter. So if you look at the Planck, the Planck paper, so Planck 
a satellite experiment absorb the CMB photons to infer these numbers, omega p, omega dark matter, omega lambda. Of course, the Planck experiment is not the only one to measure the energy densities, uh, but that there are other, uh, in particular, dark energy part uh, from uh, supernova uh, type 1a and uh, baryon or the energy component. Sorry, sorry. Dark, matter, dark matter component is baryon acoustic oscillation. <clears throat> because the galaxy structures depend on the presence of dark matter in the early universe, because the, uh, there's a collapse of matter in the local dense uh, regions. So because of the you can infer also dark matter uh, density from baryon acoustic oscillation, so-called baryon acoustic. <clears throat> so this is the, we have information for dark matter from cosmology. So, uh, and the locally solar system so dark matter density does not change much in the in the solar system because the is the galaxy is a huge in comparison to the size of solar system so you can treat the dark dark matter density uh, to be constant uh, over the solar system but, but we need information for dark matter density, uh, dark matter density uh, locally. So local dark matter density measured to be this size, 0 0.4 uh, giga electron volt per uh, cubic centimeter. And also uh, dark matter uh, from the rotational curve, also in our uh, uh, galaxy, so Milky Way, our galaxy, we can draw kind of draw this kind of uh, uh, we can uh, measure the rotational curve. rotation velocity because the uh, our galaxy is a spiral galaxy but certain galaxy does not uh, does not rotate but uh, our galaxy is the rotating uh, around the center of the galaxy so then uh, we can measure the rotational velocity. So it's moving, uh, rotating along the particular direction. But it doesn't, maybe sometimes in I mean, the other galaxies, it, it is not always the case. So, so solar systems around the disk. So <clears throat> from there, uh, you can, uh, determine the dark matter density uh, as a function of radius. Typically, uh, something like this. Density. Uh, 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 decreases uh, <clears throat> as you in increase uh, distance, right? So typically, uh, uh, the simulation uh, is decreasing so one over R. <clears throat> one over R, and then there's a core density kind of saturated near the core. This is core, but uh, it's far off as one over R as you go further out uh, from, uh, from the center of the galaxy. So then, uh, uh, you can infer it. I heard that there are uh, several ways to measure the dark matter density locally. So they are, they are compatible with each other. So, so from the uh, 
uh, rotational velocity or kind of local movement around the solar system. So you have two measures, two ways to determine the dark matter density. But the, the dark matter profile, so this is the uh, local density might be okay. So locally it's okay. The small certain error plus minus, like a plus minus 0 0.2. Still a large error, uh, but uh, there's more errors in the dark matter profile. This uh, dark matter profile. So there are many uh, candidates like uh, NFW. So a to iso summer, etc. etc. So there are many candidates. So we are we are we are not going to discuss uh, in this uh, today in detail. Just to, uh, there are many. So there are a lot of uncertainties. In particular, in the center of galaxy, because they, there are many uh, visible, uh, actually, yeah, there are many particles, many many stars uh, near the center of galaxy. So measurement is uh, uh, very very poor. So. Okay, sorry, uh, yeah, this is enough for document introduction. And yeah, the, but the, anyway, so uh, I forgot to tell you that the dark matter is the electromagnetic neutral and gravity only, uh, gravitational interaction only. And there is no dark matter candidate. So what is the, we are interested in uh, particle dark matter, but the not, which is not in the standard model. Because of that, uh, we are going to uh, think about uh, new particle, introducing new particles. Okay, so uh, let me continue to discuss uh, the gauge theories. Uh, yeah. So the first, uh, first, uh, let me discuss you on gauge theory, non-relativity. Do you have a, any question on, until now? No question, so. I, I was thinking, um, uh, why can neutrinos not be dark matter? Uh, but I think it's just because they're very fast, right? Or yeah, there are, yeah initially the dark dark matter. I mean, this if uh, the dark the neutrino uh, is electromagnetic neutral, uh, but it has the uh, weak interactions, and we know that what is the dark matter. I mean, the neutrino abundance is. Uh, just okay. we didn't know about uh, neutrino masses in the past, but the, uh, the we have more information on the neutrino masses, and then there's the upper bound on the absolute value of neutrinos. So uh, from the neutrino masses is just uh, about uh, uh, I forgot. Some, some, somewhere I written down somewhere. Uh, so, because in a particular type of neutrino, so anti electron neutrino mass smaller than 2.05 uh, electron volt from Tro Chu uh, experiment that used the uh, tritium. Uh, decay, tritium beta decay, 
just to uh, they are looking at the uh, tail of the electron energy spectrum the tail the, the energy spectrum uh, depends on the neutrino mass in the tail so there's just to, they wanted to see the feature feature uh, feature of the electron energy spectrum and also cosmic microwave background uh, the sum of the neutrino mass is smaller than 0 0.17 electron volt so this is the cmb oops so those in information i think the i forgot the numbers but the uh, neutrino as as far as i think the zero point Nine, 90, about 90 electron volt we need to explain the total dark matter density, but it's much smaller than this. So I think the less than 1% in total, total energy density. So it's negligible. And yeah, the main region is this one, it's a CMB. Uh, constraint on the neutrino masses. And as you said, uh, if neutrinos are dark matter, then you don't uh, form the structures because they, they are moving so fast and they don't collapse. They are, it is not easy to uh, make them collapse. So don't uh, form any uh, structure. Uh, so actually, uh, the in the case of the mass, the measurement of neutrinos, uh, I think the cosmology and Earth-based experiment they are competing with each other. But uh, now, I mean, cosmology is winning at the moment, and in the future maybe uh, this is the we don't know whether this neutrino is Majorana or Dirac for Trich. Uh, experiment. We just just uh, if neutrino has non-zero mass, uh, we can uh, measure them. But in the case of Majorana and neutrino, uh, neutrino needs uh, bed, double beta decay. Uh, measure the Majorana neutrino mass, but the, if it is Dirac. It is not possible. So I think the, the only hope for neutrino mass measurement, independent of whether it is the Dirac or Majorana, will be the tritium beta decay or other beta decays. So in any case, in the future, I think the uh, this uh, Troichik, I Katrin. I think the, in the future, the Katrin experiment will have a better precision, similar precision uh, as in the CMB uh, experiment, 0 0.2 something. So yeah, I think they will be interesting. Uh, in any case, uh, let me go to the UN gauge theory, uh, non-relativistic version. So let me start uh, uh, from Schrodinger uh, equation. So, so Schrodinger, uh, <coughs> I don't know if you thought about the Schrodinger equation at the level of Lagrangian. So you can write down the Lagrangian for Schrodinger in this way. In this way. So this is the Lagrangian for the Schrodinger. Or the second term can be uh, rewritten in a different form. After, uh, after integration by part, like uh, so the second term integration by part. Okay, so then the you have equivalent to uh, Lagrangian up to total and derivative. If, <clears throat> so this is a Lagrangian density, and this precise wave function uh, depends on 
uh, space and time. So this is the uh, electron wave function. Then uh, from there, uh, you can uh, uh, obtain the Schrodinger uh, equation. The variation. If you vary the Lagrangian uh, with respect to the electron wave function, then you will get the Schrodinger equation, which is the given by Of course, this is free, uh, a, a free Schrodinger equation. So this is free Schrodinger equation, but if you include the electromagnetic interactions uh, you need to change time derivative to uh, uh, by including this uh, electrostatic potential and uh, special uh, gradient can be extended by including the gauge potential. So this phi, so electrostatic potential. And this is the vector potential. So then as a consequence, uh, of course, the, you can also say the Lagrangian Schrodinger plus electromagnetic interaction will be <clears throat> something like so. This is weird kind of weird uh, replacement because the, the time derivative is real, and also a special gradient is also real. So you are adding something complex, some i. There's an i, right? Because, but the, nonetheless, uh, in any case, the Schrodinger equation contains this i. So uh, the wave function is complex. There's nothing wrong in this replacement. Just to, uh, and then. Uh, Okay, so let me go back to this one. So therefore this gradient, special gradient, can be written this way. So therefore, uh, you have a Schrodinger equation with the electromagnetic interaction. This way. So in the non-relativistic limit, normally uh, the we treat the uh, electromagnetic interaction as a background. So this uh, kind of background field. Like a constant electric field or constant magnetic field. And then the electron is moving around in that background. So then you only have to solve this Schrodinger equation in the presence of the background uh, electric or magnetic field. In this case, the uh, photon, you, you are not interested in the photon. So you don't, the photon is not emitting, just the particle motion. Okay. So, but the 
uh, it is noticed that uh, the electromagnetic interaction has its own particle. So, and then the background is does not stay uh, the same. Just to, the background can fluctuate, and then you can create or annihilate uh, particle from the background. So then you have to think about uh, also photons. Photon can be emitted or received. Uh, observed, for instance. So uh, here I wanted to tell you that uh, about gauge theory. So here there's a gauge symmetry in this uh, Lagrangian, Schrodinger electromagnetic Lagrangian. Uh, the gauge symmetry is the gauge symmetry means the Lagrangian, the form of the Lagrangian does not change. So, so let me call this X collectively. So X is the uh, X is the space and time. So theta is a function. So this is a real function. And also you are uh, shifting gauge potential by a special gradient of the uh, this function. So, or transformation, transformation parameter. And also you also change the electro Static potential by time derivative. So, in each case, you are redefining the vector potential and electrostatic potential at the same time. Then, the Lagrangian, or uh, uh, in particular, the Lagrangian keeps the same form. And the equation motion does not change. So equation motion uh, just to uh, you replace all unheated quantity by head heat heated quantity. Okay. So then, uh, yeah, as you know, this uh, kind of degree of freedom exists because the what is the physical is the electric or magnetic field. So the background field, electric field, and the magnetic field uh, remains the same even after these transformations. But this uh, degree of freedom is important uh, for the. Uh, Gauge theory, in particular in the uh, relativistic uh, uh, version. So actually, if there is a symmetry, then you can say that there is one-to-one -one correspondence of co correspondence between conserved charge, conserved conserved quantities. Maybe it may not, you may not call it charge, but sometimes energies, so quantities. So there is one to one correspondence. If you have a symmetry, then you have a conjunct charges. So in this case, uh, gauge theory, you want elect, you, we call this gauge symmetry, oops, the U1 electromagnetism. And the uh, electric charge so, is conjunct. So called, this is a kind of meta, meta theorem. Uh, okay, uh, let me just do, uh, finish my discussion on. Uh, the relativistic Lagrangian, and then we we'll make a pause a little bit and go to the non-Abelian case. Uh, 
So I discussed relativistic, non-relativistic U1 theory. So now relativistic, relativistic theory. Uh, so we interested in the Dirac Lagrangian. So of course, of, 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 although the Schrodinger Lagrangian, uh, let me uh, call you, there is the first uh, derivative uh, in time, but there is a, uh, Oops, where is it? So, uh, there is a second derivative in space. Although I didn't write down, there is also a, a rest mass term, this one. Although the energy, we assume that energy is uh, subtracted by mass. So here, uh, uh, this will be the energy, right? This will be the energy, but the energy contains on, only kinetic energy. But if you uh, include a mass, rest mass, the rest mass is not important for, non, for the non-relativistic case, but you could add non -relative, uh, rest mass here, So from the point of the uh, gauge symmetry, this term is also allowed, right? So here, uh, so gauge symmetry here, right? Just uh, this is the U1, e to the i zeta. The U1, I forgot to tell you, U1, what is the U1? So U1 is the, the unitary transformation. U1. So one is the one parameter, so which is the zeta, right? So, so because of that, uh, so you are allowed to add this mass term, and the, when you uh, uh, measure energy, just to, you can subtract rest mass from the total energy. So just to, uh, it's, a matter, it's a matter of conventions. But the here, in principle, you can write down in this form, and then the Dirac. Of course, here this uh, in the case of Schrodinger, this precise uh, uh, this uh, it's not a column. It's not. It's a just a C uh, function, right? C function complex. But in the case of Dirac, you know, uh, we are uh, promoting the electron wave function to To column. Okay, so this one. It looks very similar, right? It looks very similar. And this mass term and this psi bar equal to psi theta comma zero. The thing is that the uh, this uh, gamma mu. It's zero. So we are using this convention. So this is the four by four gamma matrix. Gamma matrix is and the sigma mu to one point sigma and sigma bar one and sigma bar. So the form of the gamma matrix is depends on the basis. So here, call we are in vial representation. So you can also use a direct uh, representation alternatively. Uh, so here, because uh, this is a sigma, by the way, this is a sigma vector. 
the Pauli matrix is and sigma one equal to zero. The Pauli matrix is take this form. This form. And also this gamma, you can show that, uh, yeah, for instance, uh, the gamma zero equal to zero, one, one. So one, this is the two by two. So this is a two by two identity. So this is identity, sorry. This is two by two identity, etc. You can just to uh, identify <coughs> uh, the matrix form explicitly. And also the chirality, uh, maybe I just to fix the notations when we write here. So here, it's just a wave function. Instead of psi theta, uh, we have a psi bar. And because this gamma matrix is four by four, uh, the wave function uh, psi is a four component, uh, four component uh, column. So because the size is a four component, let's uh, uh, take, uh, because the uh, this gamma matrix is uh, multiplied to the four component spinner, and this uh, gamma matrix is two by two uh, block form, two by two block form. Uh, because of that, uh, we are, uh, decomposing the drug spinner into two components. So these are two component, upper two component, and the lower another two component, we call spinners. The component spinner. Uh, in comparison, this psi is a four component, we call Dirac four component spinner, Dirac spinner. So uh, just let me fix uh, more notations. So five, gamma five, we can construct from the product of the all the uh, possible gamma matrices. So gamma five is the, you can compute explicitly, uh, take this form. So this is chirality operator in the chirality operator uh, uh, from there uh, of course the chirality operator if you take the square of the chirality operator it becomes identity four by four identity and also you can go further to define the projection operator, uh, PR equal to one plus gamma five. So gamma five, yeah, gamma five, yeah, five can be upper or lower. It doesn't, yeah, it's not important. But so here, yeah, if you take this one and this identity, this identity is four by four again. So then you can get this. Therefore, uh, if you operate uh, the projection operator, so R here is left-handed, right-handed, sorry. And then I forgot to tell you that this two component, L is the left-handed. And the right is R is right handed, stand for uh, right handed spinner. And after acting the projection operator on the drug spinner, you will show that only you are left with the uh, right handed spinner 
you are projecting out the left hand spinner. So just recall this Psi R. Although this uh, Psi R is the two component spinner, we are using it as, as if it is four component spinner uh, with the left handed uh, partner being projected out. Similarly, you can define the projection operator for the, for the left handed spinner. In the case, the I, the, 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 so this is two by two identity. Then you can act the left handed projection operator on the direct spinner. You will get this. For this is Psi L. Okay. So you can show uh, the property of the projection operator. Easily. And this one. Because I'm spending time to explain this because the chirality is important uh, for weak interactions. And because the chirality. Uh, Depending on the chirality, we have different uh, interactions, weak interactions. So this chirality operator, I forgot to tell you about the important uh, algebra. So we call so called the Clifford algebra. So Clifford algebra is important for, sorry, for, for uh, uh, matrix calculation. With the gamma matrices. So, clear for algebra. So, if you take the anti commutator of the two gamma matrices, then you will get twice eta mu nu identity, y phi identity. So, this anti commutator is the gamma mu. Gamma nu plus gamma nu, gamma mu. And this eta here is the inverse metric. So in our convention, this eta has a diagonal component, one minus one minus one minus one, four by four matrix. So you can check that this is true, this algebra. Uh, <clears throat> The gamma matrices will satisfy this algebra. And also for gamma five, you can show if you take the anti commutator uh, with gamma five and gamma mu, this equal to zero identically. So, <clears throat> okay. So just this is the convention until now. Just so you can re remember this part. Uh, so yeah, in that in that case, uh, you can actually show starting from Dirac. Although uh, Dirac uh, a spinner is a column vector instead of C function, you can recover the Schrodinger Lagrangian. Uh, of course, the uh, free Lagrangian there should be. Uh, uh, of course, the, there are more component uh, in the case of Dirac because the, we are describing not only electron but also positron from Dirac. In the case of Schrodinger, we have only positron, so electron. Here, they indicate Dirac, electron, and positron. So we double uh, the spectrum. And uh, of course, the, there is no spin information in this Schrodinger equation. So because of the, what Pauli did first, that he introduced a two component spinner. Here, two component spinner instead of C function, okay? So this is the natural for you to think. Two component spinner, this is Pauli. 
already Schrodinger from Schrodinger to Pauli. Uh, they knew already how to introduce uh, uh, spin uh, by uh, by generalizing uh, electron wave function from C function to component to, to component spinner. And then what uh, Dirac did is the, he introduced one more uh, two component spinner to to describe the electron. Of course, the uh, it's not clear yet, but the left handed right handed uh, kind of just to uh, left handed means the left handed electron, right handed means the right handed ele electron. So there's also uh, uh, positron, also positron left handed or positron right handed, etc. But uh, just the, uh, the, the, the final outcome uh, of the Dirac Lagrangian is that uh, not only electron with the two spins stays positron with the two spin states. Because of that, uh, you need to have a four complex functions. It makes sense, right? You need, the, instead of one function, you need four complex functions that uh, fills the four component uh, Dirac spinner. So, so four component Dirac spinner, psi equal to, psi one, psi two, This one, right? So then the each uh, component in this Dirac spinner will be shredding wave function. Wave function. But uh, we, are, we have a spin information, so up and down. So we have a different uh, shredding wave function for up and down. And we have a different shredding wave function for positron. Uh, but uh, for for the for relativity with the spin, uh, you need to consider this Dirac Lagrangians. It is very important to discuss. And then uh, starting from the Dirac Lagrangian, you can recover uh, when the the speed of electron or positron is very small. The velocity is much smaller than the speed of light. You can show that the Dirac Lagrangian will recover the Schrodinger. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, so the case theory, uh, okay, so here, uh, as I said before, the gauge symmetry for the vector potential, as maybe for the uh, electromagnetic uh, uh, potentials, uh, which was the 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 thing is that uh, next thing to do is the uh, how to How to extend uh, electromagnetism uh, in the relativistic theory. So first thing is the relativity. Uh, we need to introduce uh, the gauge potential, which is uh, composed of two uh, electrostatic and vector potential. And then uh, the gauge symmetry, gauge transformation, and the combine into in this form, round the mu, zeta. So round the mu here stand for. So this one. And so this is the gradient. Gradient one form, but uh, it's, it's a derivative operator. 
So uh, the wave function psi goes to So before Schrodinger wave function changes by phase, right? This one. So similarly, a Dirac spinner changes by this, uh, by the same phase. So because of that, uh, we are. Uh, Dirac uh, field coupled to electromagnetic field. Can be written down in this form minus here and this d mu psi equal to so we call this covariant derivative in the sense that uh, this covariant derivative changes gauge transform under the gauge transformation up to phase So because of that, we call this is covariant derivative. So round mu uh, replaced by the d mu uh, in the gauge transformation. We change the covariant derivative by phase. And f mu nu is constructed by taking the derivative of the gauge potential. And uh, you can see that uh, this gauge potential uh, transforms transform under the gauge transformation. Because the, uh, you see uh, A new transforms. Zeta, F mu nu transforms. Minus because of that, uh, you see minus this one. So because of that is the derivatives, they doesn't depend on the order of the derivatives. So this is so because of that F mu nu is invariant. So we call this F mu nu uh, the field strength tensor. And divide this uh corresponds to electric field or the magnetic field. So I think that from the textbook you have learned already or from particle physics lecture undergraduate, you have learned this already, how to write down uh, electric field or magnetic field in terms of the field strength tensor. Uh, okay, let's make a, a short break uh, for five minutes. And uh, we'll continue. So, uh, you have a question? Mm. Mm, well, why the epimu nu? If there are a reason about epimu nu called the field strength tensor, 
I mean the nomenclature. I mean the name. Yeah. Well, um, strengths. Uh, well, this uh, we call this A is the field. So, so instead electric or magnetic field, uh, we call the vector potential as a field because it will be, it corresponds to particle, photon. So the A mu is basic uh, uh, quantity, the photon, uh, and then maybe you can describe the uh, motion of photon in terms of the gauge potential. Maybe you can think of as coordinate for photon. And if you take the derivative, then there is the velocity of photon. You can think about in that way. So I don't know, the strength is just to yeah, feel the strength of field, strength of field. So, uh, yeah, I don't know, yeah. I don't know there are other ways to call this. The field strength tensor, just convention, by convention, we we are distinguishing between field and the field strength. So the field strength is given by the derivative of the field. It's kind of kinetic energy for the field. Uh, yeah, sure. Mm. Okay, so uh, let's go. Let me come back uh, from the toilet.